coming up on Time for Hope. At times of great excitement and celebration, there is something within us, God has put it there, that makes us want to sing. And that's particularly true at Christmas because the greatest of all of the truths is Emmanuel, God with us, that God became man and came on a redemptive mission. Join Dr. Frida Cruz, licensed professional counselor, and her guests as they provide practical solutions to real life problems on Time for Hope. We appreciate you joining us again on Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. We greatly appreciate our regular viewers and look forward to our new viewers becoming regular viewers as we attempt each week to offer hope to people in need of believing that there is still hope in spite of their circumstances. Believe it or not, it is that time of year already when we celebrate the birth of the Christ child, the son of the Creator God, who became like one of us so that he might redeem us. One of the things we enjoy this time of year are the familiar Christmas carols and hymns. Joining me today to share from his book titled, Come, Let Us Adore Him, Stories Behind the Most Cherished Christmas Hymns is pastor, best-selling and award-winning author, Robert Morgan. Stay with us as Rob acquaints us with the stories behind some of our most cherished Christmas hymns. And Robert, it's great having you again on Time for Hope. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. You have been one busy man since I saw you last. I saw all of the books that you now have in print and uh, you're pastoring a church still also, aren't you? Yes, the Donaldson Fellowship in Nashville. It's a wonderful congregation. and. Uh, doing some writing and a lot of what I preach uh, ends up in printed form and so we just have a good time and trust the Lord to bless it. Well, you're traveling a lot too uh, some, from what I, from yeah, what I so. saw about <laughs> you. They're good to you to, to allow you to we're do grateful. that and you say you have great help. Yes, that I've makes got, a we've difference, got wonderful people it? At, yes. at the Donaldson Fellowship, yes. Yes. This uh, little book that you have written, Come Let Us Adore Him, uh, the stories, there are the stories behind the hymns, especially the Christmas hymns that we sing, um, they're, it's amazing. Um, and I can remember when I was teaching, as I told mm -hmm. you off, off uh, camera, a Sunday school class, I tried to get my uh, class members to become aware uh, when they mm -hmm. were singing any hymn, all the hymns, any and yes. all of the hymns what they were singing, mm -hmm. what the words actually were saying. And then, of course, to learn the stories behind the hymns and then pay attention mm -hmm. to the words, uh, yeah. it, it, it becomes a, a, a wonderful combination, and especially this time of year with the hymns that we've been hearing. Some of these I've been hearing all my life. How oh, about we you? We know them. Yes, we know them well, don't we? we, and we we treasure them. I think they're special because we only sing them for a limited amount of time and then they're sort of put on the shelf again for another year. But when we get them out, they're as fresh as ever. Don't you think really some have suggested that some of these could, could be sung all year? Uh, but I think it would take away from the specialness uh, of them if we did that, don't you? Well, we're, we're used to the melodies. We hear those melodies. Now, there are times when even at our church during the year we'll sing, Oh, Come, Let Us Adore Him. Uh, Joy to the World is actually not even a Christmas carol. Uh, it was written by Isaac Watts uh, based on Psalm 98 and has more to do with the second coming than the first coming. So, of, of the first coming of Christ or the second coming of Christ. So, it's sort of... Uh, appropriate all year long, but we, we kind of reserve them for Christmas because we like that time of year and we love these songs. The tradition of singing Christmas carols goes all the way back to the Gospels, to um, Mary's song and Zachariah's song and the song of the angels in the skies of Bethlehem, glory to God on the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it is uh, our oldest Christmas tradition is the singing of songs celebrating His birth. You uh, also have mentioned, uh, and you seem to be very fond of Martin Luther. Uh, there wasn't much Luther didn't accomplish in his lifetime, was there? And you've got him connected with these Christmas hymns also. Well, absolutely. Luther has a lot to do with the way we celebrate Christmas today. Luther lived in the early 1500s in Germany. For a thousand years, people in Europe had not really sang hymns in the churches. Hmm. The singing of hymns in the medieval church 
was sort of uh, frowned upon by congregations. Uh, the priest and the choirs sang, but congregational singing was, uh, was not done a great deal. Uh, and one of the reasons was in the, uh, around the year 400, there was so much heresy that was being spread by song that church councils uh, discouraged and even outlawed or forbade the singing of hymns by congregations in order to try to keep down this, these heresies that were spreading uh, musically. So uh, Luther uh, was determined to get hymn singing back into the vernacular and back to the people uh, of Germany. And so he wrote uh, some of the hymns and then he set other people to writing hymns. Of course, he wrote The Great and Mighty Fortress is Our God. But one of his Christmas songs uh, that we still sing is from heaven, birth, uh, from heaven Above to Earth I Come. He wrote that for his little son Hans and it was sung every single year at his house in Wittenberg. Uh, and it was Luther who also began to bring some of these traditions that we associate with Christmas uh, into Germany and into the German church. And when uh, Queen Victoria married Albert from Germany, he brought some of those to England. And so in a way, the Christmas customs that we celebrate today come from England via Germany because of Martin Luther. And so he has a lot to do with our Christmas carols and the way we celebrate Christmas. Well, we, I certainly uh, appreciate Martin Luther. He's one of my favorite uh, people uh, in the history of the church. Yeah. is isn't just studying the history of the church. Uh, it, it's just a joy to study the history of the church, and you're relating so much of that along with this. Well, it, it is the most interesting slice of history because it's not only what people did, but it's what God did through people. Uh, I have a book called On This Day that is a daily devotions based upon uh, aspects and stories and incidents in Christian history. Some of them are bizarre and some of them are, are wonderful. Some of them are thrilling and heroic. So many of them have to do with the message of the incarnation of uh, God into human flesh through Jesus Christ at Bethlehem and what that means and, and how it set the whole world to singing. Norbert, do you, have you ever known a time in American history where we needed to know all of this and talk about all of this and share all of this more than we do right now? Well, see, Christmas is the one time when even non-Christian, secular, heathen, pagan, maybe even wicked people end up singing about Christ. And they go in the shopping malls and there's still joy to the world playing in the loudspeakers. And so it is a time for sharing the gospel of Christ that you don't have at any other time. And the only comparable period in American history to this was the late 1700s, which was a very secular time. There were very few Christians. Christianity was at low ebb in America. Uh, people thought the church w wasn't going to last at all. The French infidels and the influence of Voltaire and the others had, uh, right after the American Revolution, had just about spiritually demoralized the country. And then we had revival. We had the Great Awakening. And we're still living on the effects in some ways of that Great Awakening. We need another Great Awakening now. We do. We really do. I do know there is a, a, a renewed and revived interest in uh, Jonathan Edwards. Of course, mm -hmm. we know when you think of the Great Awakening, who do you think yes. of? Jonathan Edwards. Yale has opened a center, a Jonathan Edwards mm -hmm. Center, and so has uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School opened a Jonathan mm -hmm. Edwards Center. And um, so, yes, we need another Great Awakening. Yeah. I wonder if the Lord could bring <laughs> him back and let him preach something like sinners in the hands of an angry God again. I believe we are going to have a revival. I think some, I know the young people in my church are on fire for the Lord, and I think we're going to have a new generation that comes along and does great things. I really think we're going to be forced uh, mm -hmm. to seek the Lord yes. for revival, don't you? Yes. So let's move on. So we're talking about the, the Christmas hymns. Where did they come from? Uh, and then uh, the, uh, their origin. Uh, let's talk about the oldest one uh, that, that you've got recorded. Well, our oldest carols, as I mentioned, are the ones from the uh, Nativity Canticles in the Bible. Uh, there was the Song of Zechariah, the Song of Mary, the Song of Simeon in the Temple, the Song of uh, the Magnificat, uh, but particularly the Gloria in Excelsis that the angels sang. Wouldn't that. you have loved to have been there and looked up in the sky and seen that heavenly choir and heard them singing those carols? So that's the origin of Christmas carols. 
uh, one of the oldest uh, non-biblical or post-biblical hymns that we have was written by a man named Prudentius, who, uh, Aurelius Prudentius, who was a, a governor and a leader in the Roman world until he was about my age. Uh, and then he retired and began writing uh, Christian poetry. And uh, Prudentius wrote this marvelous hymn, It is my favorite Christmas carol of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds begin to be, his Alpha and Omega, he the source, the ending he of the things that are, that have been, that evermore will be. And it's a very probing, powerful song. And it's being rediscovered now and sang more and more. And it is set to an old melody called Divina Mysterium, which is a thousand years old. It's sort of a haunting melody. We sing it every year at our church on Christmas Eve of the Father's Love Begotten by uh, Prudentius. And of all of the hymns and of all of the carols, I think that may be the very most special. And it's our, one of our oldest uh, uh, as we go back into Christian history. I think people probably are not aware, many people are not aware that the Psalms themselves were hymns uh, that were sung. And, and the Reformed Church, I know in Grand Rapids, Michigan, mm -hmm. when we were there, uh, they would sing the Psalms uh, in their worship services. And so singing uh, has always been a part of uh, the church and worship and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and don't we want to sing when we're excited about uh, something or someone? Oh, we do. You know, when they brought those miners up in Chile um, some time ago, the first thing they did when they got the last one up was they all gathered together and they sang the national anthem. At times of great excitement and celebration, there is something within us, God has put it there, that makes us want to sing. And that's particularly true at Christmas because the greatest of all of the truths is Emmanuel, God with us, that God became man and came on a redemptive mission. So when you begin to see the significance of that, then you want to burst out in song. And when it is songs about the coming of Christ into this world, we call them carols and they are just so beautiful and they, are, they, they go back in our memories to our various, very earliest days. And, and I think that's why they are so precious to us. And again, I think that it is a time that we need to hear more and more and more about the Son of God, be, uh, you know, becoming the Son of Man, that sons of men might become sons of God, that, that the Creator God is the true God, mm -hmm. and that uh, His Son, Jesus Christ, is the only way the only way uh, of salvation and redemption. Tell me real quick about O Little Town of Bethlehem. O Little Town of Bethlehem was written by Phillips Brooks. Phillips You've Brooks was another... you while, while we've been sitting here <laughs> talking about these hymns. Isaac was and Philip... Yes, yeah. and he, you know, he was a giant of a man. He was six foot six. He weighed 300 pounds. He pastored in Philadelphia and then later in Boston. But he went to Bethlehem and was actually there, this was in the 1800s, for a Christmas Eve service in the Church of the Nativity. He was so moved by that that he came back to his church in Philadelphia and the children were wanting to sing a carol for a Christmas program. He just wrote those words down, O Little Town of Bethlehem. He gave it to the minister of music who was there, who quickly composed the, uh, the music to it. And it was sang for the first time in that church in Bethlehem, in, in uh, Philadelphia, and we have been loving it ever since. Well, it's time for us to take a break, but I do encourage our viewers, and I want them, even at this point, I'm encouraging them to make sure that they uh, get a copy of your book. It would make a wonderful, wonderful gift uh, for uh, someone. And so you stay right there and we'll be right back. 